right, and welcome to another episode of Raul's World of Sense. I am Raul. This time around, we're going to be looking at the Dofer A155 analog trigger sequen sequencer uh, positioned here in front of you. We're going to be looking at some of the basic features of this module, and then in some of the future segments, we're going to be going into a sound demonstration of this module as well as the expander, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the A154. So let's go ahead and jump right in and start talking about this uh, marvelous device here. Uh, first, let's talk about what a sequencer actually is going to do. Uh, if it helps to visualize this, uh, each one of these is actually tied to each other. So like each one of these is a sequence of events, and they're all numbered. So like this is one event, this is one event, this is one event, this is one event. And it will move through these events according to a clock pulse that you can feed to it. Uh, normally, uh, you can use an LFO, so you would use this uh, square wave or pulse wave over here, and feed it directly into the clock in over here. And I'll demonstrate that uh, fairly shortly here, just to see what that looks like. So I take a cable, plug it into my wave here, and then I patch it into my clock right over there. There we go. And you can see now that it is advancing through each step of events. There you go. See? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Um, I can increase the frequency at which it moves through these different events by increasing the frequency of my LFO. You can see the lights are now advancing a little bit faster. Go a little bit faster if I want to. Or I can go really, really slow, in which case it'll advance at kind of a crawl through each sequence of events. Okay, so that's the that's the clock going in. So that's just the basic idea of what a sequencer is going to do for us. Now we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the other options that you have with this sequencer because there's a few ports over here that you can also use to kind of uh, enhance how the sequencer functions. Um, but let's get back to this area up here, because that's what we're going to talk about first. Uh, you have a series of switches here, and they can be in one of three positions. They can be up, center, or down, and that goes for every one. So in the default position, I can put them all in the center right there. There we go. Down. Okay, so now they're all in the default position. Um, but let's talk about what each one of these actually does. If it's in the up position, then a trigger signal is going to be fed out from the trigger output number one, which is right over here. You have a series of trigger outputs. Um, so basically, these switches are going to allow you to select which trigger output that it will go to. Now, you may be able to see right here on the sequencer, you have a couple of lines, one above the switch and one below the switch. This is meant to help you sort of understand where the triggers are going to come out. So if you have the switch in the up position, that line is meant to tell you it's now going over to the trigger one output over here. And if you have it in the opposite position, this line tells you that it's now going over to the trigger two output. So pretty straightforward. And that is, uh, primarily the same for each step. So depending on what you have, let's just set up a quick little sequence. I'll do up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then let's get our clock back so we can see that that is actually happening because we'll have a couple of lights that help us out over there on the end. So here I go, plugging my clock back in and I will speed up my frequency of my LFO. There we go. So now you can see the lights should be alternating over here to the left of trigger one and trigger two. And those correspond to which outputs those are actually coming out from. Okay. And then the LEDs here, uh, you know, of course, are what are letting you know that. So they're visually, you know, popping out at you, letting you know. These LEDs, of course, let you know what step of the sequence that you're currently on. 
Now that's going to be entirely true for the second row down. So if I put these all in the down position, then if we follow our little line all the way across, it's now going to be going out to the gate output right down here. But if I switch them in the up position, then they're going to be going to the trigger three output. And you can see the LED now reflecting that. And then of course, if I mix them up, like do maybe low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, then it alternates. At one step, it will go out trigger three. At one step, it will go out the gate output. So these outputs over here, you can actually use for a couple of things. You can use it to uh, trigger the reset on, let's say, an LFO. Uh, you can use it to trigger a envelope. Uh, you can use it to trigger a sample and hold module. Uh, tons and tons of possibilities about what you can use these outputs for. Um, and they become much more sort of uh, practical in use when we kind of go into the demonstration a little bit later. Uh, but for now, Let's just kind of get in our minds here that the switches are going to be responsible for telling the sequencer which outputs we want them to go to. So if you want, maybe let's say on every odd step, you want a signal being sent out here and then via out to an envelope, then this would be your output for that. And if you want the second one to go to a sample and hold, so then you have the even numbered steps going out to a sample and hold, then you can do that as well all sort of going within the same clock uh, signal. So, pretty cool stuff. So that should kind of cover this little area right over here that we've talked about. We have the trigger outputs, and of course we have this. There's one more section of the top section that I want to talk about, and that's going to be this section that's labeled control over here on the far right. And uh, there's four buttons on there. Uh, they're a little bit hard to see, so I may do a little zoom in right there, just so you can see them a little bit easier. Um, you have a control start. Uh, you have a control stop, a clock input, and then a reset input. Uh, the clock input is fairly straightforward. Uh, we kind of actually used that a little while ago. Uh, so if I pipe in a clock signal right here, then it will advance through the steps according to the clock that I have. So you can see the activity in the sequence is moving forward. Now, if I do not have anything patched into that, then I can advance through the steps by hitting the clock signal or the clock button right there. So that's a little button actually right there. And if you look in the manual of the A155, you'll also see that uh, that button is also labeled as the step button. Um, this particular one happens to have it labeled clock, but that switch actually does perform that. So that's if you were trying to set up your voltages on each step uh, manually, you can just kind of move through them by pressing the switch right there. Okay, so that's the clock one. That's the one that's fairly straightforward. Now the one immediately above that is labeled stop. So it's gonna do exactly what you think it's gonna do. It's gonna stop whenever you hit it. So if I have my clock signal going in and I hit stop, the sequencer stops running. That being said, you have a little port here that you can feed a signal into. So you can actually send something, uh, a gate, or uh, some kind of CV signal to it from, let's say, a keyboard, and you can trigger it to stop if you want to. You could also have it stop on, uh, let's say, a step of the clock divider if you wanted to as well. So there's a couple ways you can stop it, but the idea is you can either press the button here manually or you can send a signal there that will do the same thing. Now that we've talked about the stop, let's talk about the start. I'll just go ahead and leave that plugged in. Uh, start does exactly what you think, so you hit start, and off it goes. On through the sequence. Uh, just like the stop port, you can pipe in a CV signal or a gate and trigger the start of your sequencer um, by an external signal. So keyboard, gate, that kind of thing. And then the one on the very bottom, which is labeled reset, 
is going to make it reset to the first step of the sequence. So let's let it get a little further, like let's say maybe around six, we'll hit reset and it jumps to the first step. This is in case you want to start your sequence over for whatever reason, then you can. Uh, or the other kind of uh, situation where you might run into that is if you're advancing through the steps and let's say you're at seven and now you want to go back to the first step, you can just hit reset and it'll jump you back to the beginning. So there you go. That's the reset one. And the port, again, uh, will allow you to pipe a CV or gate signal into it and trigger the reset of the sequence. So you can start it back at the beginning at a fixed interval if you wanted to by using external clock or keyboard signal. And there we are. So we've kind of touched on the top area of this uh, and now I think we have a pretty good grasp on it. So now let's move on down to the next section over here. We're going to talk about this section here and then we'll talk about this here wrapping up towards the end. Um, so as I was saying before, uh, each step of the sequence is kind of tied together. Um, here at step one of our sequence, uh, these switches, as we said before, affect where the trigger outputs go to, or if they're in the middle, then no trigger output is sent. But immediately below those switches, you have a little dial here. And this dial will actually send out your CV voltage, uh, which you can feed output to like let's say an oscillator and you can give it a certain value uh, this translates uh, in, in practical use to notes so you basically can send it a note and it will play that note just like most uh, digital sequencers if you're used to that uh, the values of the notes are going to depend on this switch here at the end so you have one volt setting on the switch two volt setting on the switch or four volt setting on the switch and it's labeled range. So in the one volt setting, you're actually spanning one octave because the, you know, the standard one volt per octave. Uh, in the second one, you're going a span of two octaves. And then in the lower one, you're actually doing four octaves. So depending on uh, what you set this up for, you can set up a sequence of notes going out to your VCO, uh, or if you, like, let's say you uh, feed this out, put to, let's say, a filter or something else, uh, it will, instead of having, like, a pitched value, will then have a uh, incremental value that is, you know, from low to high or, you know, uh, low to high values. Uh, but still within the different ranges. So if you're in one volt, then it's only actually a, a small span of... Uh, of values, or two, it's a little broader of a range of values, or four, you've got a pretty broad range of values. So you can make a really big change happen. Um, this will uh, sort of make much more sense when we have to actually use this and feed it out, because uh, right now we're just talking conceptually about what all of these do. But that's the idea behind these uh, switches here, or not switches, but uh, dials. So each one of these dials is going to control each value at each step of the sequence. Immediately in front of the range you have a dial that's labeled glide and that glide value uh, is going to determine uh, how the slew limiter inside of here is going to affect moving from each step. Now normally if you have the glide set to zero then it's just going to go from one value note to the next value note to the next value note and on and on and on. But if you adjust the glide, then it will sort of slide to the next value. So if you had a, like, I don't know, a C, and then you had a D immediately next to it, it will slide up to the D. Uh, and then if you had a D to an E, then it would slide up to the E, depending, and the amount of glide is going to be determined by this. So the more glide you have, the more pronounced that effect is gonna be of sliding from one value to the next. And of course, you can have from zero all the way to 10. So that pretty much covers all the dials here, because whatever we uh, said goes on with one actually translate to all of these. 
So let's move on to the next section here. Uh, this has a few different uh, type terms here uh, that we may not have encountered before. Uh, but one kind of helping little thing on this uh, module is you have this little line that goes from this section straight over to here, and that's meant to indicate that this section is actually tied to this row of values. Now you have four different ones, four different ports here. Pre-out, post-out, sample and hold control, and glide control. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit right there so you can see those a little bit better. So there you go, that way you know what we're talking about because in my zoomed out uh, portion it's a little bit harder to see those. But uh, now that you've gotten a good look at those, uh, now let's talk about what each one of them does. The pre-out is going to be the values that are found going out from these dials before they go through the glide section of the sequencer. Uh, the post out then of course is going to be after the slew limiter. So this will be always for the most part no glide and then this will be with glide whatever you have this set to. Now of course if you have this set to zero uh, ideally they should be the same. Immediately below that you have a sample and hold control. Um, Sample and hold, if you watched any of the previous videos, um, basically you can set a sequence for sample and hold, and you know it will play notes at each event that is triggered. The idea here is a little bit different um, in that you're going to use the sample and hold control to uh, hold notes on this device. So at the sample and hold control, if it receives a high value at this port, uh, it will hold that control value. So let's say uh, a high value is received via this port on step one. Whatever CV voltage is being fed out there will be held until that voltage changes. So if then a low voltage comes, then it will change depending on the value of that. And we'll demonstrate that a little bit later so that way, you know, you put a little more meat on the bone, so to speak. Um, immediately next to that, you have the glide control. And whenever a control signal is fed into this input right here, uh, that being a low value, then it will actually affect whether the glide is active. So every time it receives a low voltage there, the glide will be triggered. Every time, so in that case, the reverse is true. So if you have a high voltage going into the glide, then there will be no glide. Now, if you have nothing plugged into the glide control, then of course, whatever your glide setting is, is going to be the amount of glide that is applied to your CV voltage going from step to step. So there we go. That's the explanation of that. Now, these steps or these ports here are going to be primarily the same down here. Uh, that is, they have the same function for this row of dials as well. Uh, the pre-out is going to be pre-glide, and then the post-out is going to be post-glide. Sample and hold control, same is going to be true. It helps you hold a note uh, whenever it receives a high control signal at that input. And then glide control, of course, whenever you receive a low input, uh, low control signal, that is, uh, then it will activate glide. So there we are. Uh, something that is different about this row, which we're going to talk about here, is the values at which you can set it to. Now, uh, we were talking about uh, how this uh, section up here, you can go one octave range, two octave range, or four octave range. Uh, this one that's labeled scale, uh, it does something similar to what this does in that it affects the range of the values being set on these dials. However, the overall range is much larger. So uh, it goes from a value, now this is information that I got off, off the internet and the website at dofer.com, uh, it goes from about a zero to about a seven uh, volts there. So it spans about seven octaves. Uh, it is a little more um, 
unwieldy in that, you know, you can't quickly look and go, okay, that's one octave, uh, because you would then have to do a little bit of math, you know, unless you're really good at that, like just giving it a glance and then going, oh yeah, so between zero and 10, uh, if I divide my 10 across seven volts or you know, whatever the span is, then that's going to equal one octave. So then I'd have to set it to about 4.5. I'm just making up numbers. But um, that's the basic idea. So this is not as a precise control as it says in the manual as this is up here. So that's the idea. You can still get a fairly good range out of this. Uh, however, again, not as precise. Uh, now, it does have an extra option, this row at the bottom does, in that you have these ports down here at the bottom. And if you take a look at those, they're labeled external CV audio inputs. Now, these can be used to do sequenced frequency modulation. And if something is plugged in here, like let's say you patch in a VCO into step one and step three. At step one and step three, rather than it sending out a control voltage value at, sorry about that, at post out over here, it's gonna be sending out audio at that output according to whatever this is set to. So when something is patched in here, this works as an attenuator or a volume control uh, for whatever is patched in here. Now what that's going to translate to, we'll hear this a little bit later, is basically you can get sequenced frequency modulation, which sounds pretty cool, almost percussive in a way. Um, but it's a very, very cool effect. Now if that's if, only if you use audio. Now if you use a CV signal going into any of these inputs, then rather than the CV setting of the dial uh, being sent to the output, whatever uh, value the CV going in, so if you had an LFO sine wave going into this, then that step would then be a sine wave going out the post out. And again, that's this one, not that one. This one is just kind of more centrally located and that's why my finger keeps kind of gravitating towards that one. Um, so yeah, there you have it. And this is actually a pretty cool effect. I really, really like the way that works um, and the kind of possibilities that it can create for you. So in a nutshell, that is going to be our little basic uh, explanation of the Dofer A155 analog trigger sequencer. Uh, we're going to be moving into the demonstration portion here coming up and uh, taking a look at how you can use some of these features that we talked about today.